Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to Redeeming Grace's uh, worship service, and uh, it is good to be able to once again to connect to you all uh, through this technology and uh, to be able to bring to you uh, what we would normally have here in our worship service, the preaching of the word, reading of the word, prayer, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. But what we're missing is we're missing the gathering of the church. Uh, but I want to make an announcement. I'm so thankful that slowly things will be hopefully phasing back uh, to normal. As many of you know, our governor um, put out an executive order where he is uh, enacting phase two, uh, bringing everything back, uh, hopefully in a direction to where it was before. Uh, with the COVID-19 virus. And so uh, as it applies to churches, churches are allowed to start meeting after Thursday of uh, this week uh, at 50% of their capacity. So uh, tonight uh, I and the deacons will be having a phone meeting and we're gonna discuss this to see what we can do uh, to uh, be able to next Lord's Day uh, to gather our people together. Uh, there's going to be a lot of details to talk about, so please pray for us that the Lord would give us wisdom in doing this. We want to do this in such a way that uh, that we are continuing to uh, submit to our local authorities, our governing authorities, uh, and still trusting that they are trying to do the best to alleviate this, uh, uh, this virus. And yet, at the same time, uh, we want to go as full in as we can to begin to start worshiping together. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of um, encouragements for you. Number one, uh, please be uh, be checking your emails, uh, other, for, uh, other ways we communicate to see the latest updates on how we're going to implement this. Uh, there's gonna be some input we need from you all, so uh, please, please be looking at that. And also, uh, just to encourage you, uh, just to be praying about what you feel you need to do as far as uh, do you need to, to go ahead and, and join with us and, and come out? Or what would your conscience say uh, as far as how you would react to this? And so, but again, we want to encourage all of our people that if, uh, if you feel you have a green light to come and be with us, we want you to be with us and we want to establish ways we can do that. Uh, that would be in accordance to uh, the executive orders that have been put out. And I praise the Lord for this. It has been a long time, and I thank the Lord that hopefully, uh, Lord willing, next Lord's Day, we are going to be gathered together. It may be in the form of two different services, depending on how many people want to come out. Uh, but nonetheless, it is so much better uh, than what we have now. So we thank the Lord for this, and let's continue to pray that we continue to move in this direction until it can be... A, uh, that we can all gather together uh, without any distancing, uh, without any reservations whatsoever, and we can be fully engaged together as a congregation. So let's pray that way together, okay? But well, I want to call us to worshiping the Lord this morning by reading Psalm chapter 66, the first couple of verses. It says, Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works? And that is what we want to do this morning. Wherever you're at, in your living room, your kitchen table, or wherever, we want to, in the time we have together, we want to, out of our hearts, even though we're separated, we want to say, Lord, how awesome are your works? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for being this awesome God. We thank you that out of our heart, we can give that true praise and that true statement glorifying you for who you are. There is none in this world who deserves praise and glory like this because there is none in this world who has done the mighty works that you have done. You alone are God and you alone deserve all of our praise, our glory, and our adoration. So Father, I pray in that sense that we can just bring that to you this morning. Even though we're separated, Father, I pray that out of our individual hearts that we might glorify you on this Lord's day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Song sheets. We are going to sing first, um, I will glory in my Redeemer, and then we will follow that immediately with number two. 
201, there is a redeemer. So let's, as we were, the pastor just admonished us, uh, we praise God for his works. Let's praise him for the mightiest of works that he did in Christ. So let's sing.
scripture reading, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31. We are uh, deviating from our normal time in scripture uh, as we're going through 1 Chronicles. And today, with the occasion of it being Mother's Day, uh, we just wanted to give attention to that by looking at Proverbs chapter 31. And what a wonderful reminder of all the different qualities that a virtuous, worthy woman brings. And uh, as it's been told, it's not necessarily that all these qualities are all found in one uh, woman, one wife, or one mother. Uh, she would truly be a superwoman if that were the case. Uh, but nonetheless, these are the qualities that you do find to one degree or another uh, in a woman who uh, gives care to her household. And so uh, I want to read this by way of just an encouragement uh, to our mothers today and also as an encouragement for all of those who are around mothers, whether husbands, children, or what other relations there are, uh, that we might give the Lord just tremendous thanks for the gift of wives and mothers that we have. So Proverbs 31, let's look beginning in verse 10 and read through the end of the chapter. Uh, this is the mother of King Solomon, uh, known here as King uh, Lemuel, and she is giving him instruction like a good mother should to a son on this is what a worthy woman is. So, verse 10, an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly. But you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Let's pray. Well, Father, this morning we want to, to pray centered around the theme of mothers, the first thing we need to do, Father, is we need to give you great praise. We need to give you praise for mothers, mothers who have been what mothers are to be, Father, uh, not simply one who gives birth to a child, but one who truly mothers a child, one who sacrifices herself in love for a child, one who is truly a mother and shows that in so many multifaceted ways, day by day. Lord, how we thank you for this. How we thank you for those who carry on this day-to-day -day sacrifice, always putting themselves second, always putting themselves behind others so that others can be edified and others can be put forward. Lord, we thank you for this great gift. And we thank you for what the great gift of motherhood is. Because over and over in your word, Father, you describe it as a blessing. Over and over in your word, Father, motherhood is really uh, 
just the natural outcome of, of marriage, where two people come together, they leave their own families, they come together as husband and wife, one flesh, and then Father, they begin their own family. It is just the, the natural course of things that, that we see described in Scripture over and over, to go and to be fruitful and to multiply. And to have dominion over the earth, to, to carry out this creation mandate. And so, Lord, we want to give you great praise for mothers. But also, Father, what we want to do this morning is we want to pray for mothers. And, Lord, even, even though we, we do this, Lord, and we want to pray for mothers in all sorts of different situations, I realize that we cannot be exhaustive and we cannot lay out every single situation that a mother is facing. So Father, I trust that, that mothers will know that and that they will even lift up a, a prayer for their specific situation. And fathers, we think about mothers. Um, oftentimes our heart is first of all drawn to those who are new mothers, those who Maybe if it's their first child or second or third, Lord, we think about them with their little ones. Lord, we think about mothers who are mothers truly, but yet, Father, their children have not made an entrance into this world. Uh, they are a mother in the sense that they are carrying that blessed child in their womb. And you have opened that womb, Father. Uh, that is the fruit of your doing, and we thank you for that. And so, Lord, we thank you for these mothers, and we pray for them as they go through their specific challenges, challenges of maybe having a newborn or an infant or a toddler, Lord, and, and all of those unique things, the unique joys it brings to a home, and yet the unique challenges. I pray for them, Father. Give them the strength, the stamina, the endurance that they need, Father, and help them along. Lord, we pray for for mothers who have older ones in the home. Maybe they're preteens. Maybe they are teenagers, Father. Uh, maybe they are uh, uh, young adults, but yet still in the home. Maybe college age. And Lord, we think about all the different challenges and the unique situations that, that those different ages bring, Father, where, where at the early age of that, you, you have someone who is really not a child, but yet really not an adult. And convictions are starting to, to really take hold and thinking and, and things like that, Father. And we pray that, that as they've been instructed in the things of God, that those things are taking root in a heart that is fertile and accepting of the seed of the truth of the Word of God. And I pray, Lord, that that truth will just shepherd them through their teenage years when now opportunities crop up and, and, and really in a real sense, Father, parents and even others can see what is really there in the heart because that fruit is made manifest. And so I pray for mothers in, in those situations that they can be wise guides and counselors uh, with their children, Father. And even with young adults, Lord, as as now really that child is about to step out uh, on their own, Father, maybe through marriage, maybe leaving the home uh, to pursue a career, whatever it is, Lord, that, that Father, that mother will just pour in those, the, those last and final amounts of godly wisdom and godly counsel and encouragement, guidance that they can because they are on the very doorstep of, of of a dynamic change that will come in the relationship. And Father, we pray for mothers of adult children, children who have left the home, children who are adults, children who are accountable for their actions in the fullest. And Lord, we just pray that as, as now the role has switched and now oftentimes counsel and guidance is is, is really only accepted when it's invited, Father. I pray, Lord, that you will help mothers in those situations as well. And Father, we want to pray also, not just in those different seasons of life, but we want to pray for mothers who are, who are in different uh, 
who are dealing with different issues with their children. Father, with some of our children, Lord, uh, we've been so blessed. Lord, we, we see the faithfulness of parenting, the faithfulness of, of guidance, and Father, how that just takes root. And it's such a, a blessing to see that. And it's almost a, as if things just, uh, by your good providence, just work out in just a wonderful way. And yet, Father, we know of mothers who are struggling, Father. They are faithful. They do the things that you've called them to do. And yet, Father, the heart of that young person is, is just obstinate or hard toward the truth. And so, Father, they're not seeing what other mothers see. They're just as faithful, just as consistent. And yet, Father, because the soil of the heart is different in their child, Lord, it's oftentimes different. And there's a struggle in the home. And there is wisdom that needs to be petitioned from you. And there has to be much love and much patience. So, Lord, I pray for those mothers who are having those difficult times and they're trying their best to be consistent. And they see their failures. I just pray, Father, they can lead upon the gospel. And they can know that they're forgiven. And each day is a new day. And Father, I pray for mothers who are dealing with situations where their children are facing physical battles. Father, we, we hear about these, these heartbreaking things all the time, where children will have terminal illnesses, or they'll have lifelong illnesses, chronic battles that they go through, Father. And Lord, as much as that poor child is suffering, and as much as that child is having to endure, how how it just breaks a mother's heart to see their child go through those things. And, and yet they cannot do anything, Father, many times, except just to pray, just to pray and lean upon you. And so, Father, I pray that you, you give those mothers strength today and for the days coming. Help them be built up. Help them trust in you, to believe upon you. As we heard in Sunday school this morning, to have hope in you, Father for the difficulties they're going through now and the difficult days that lie ahead. And then, Father, I want to pray for mothers who have lost children. Lord, I cannot imagine the depths of despair that that is because I've never experienced that in your good providence. But, Father, there are many mothers who have loved their children, both born and unborn, and yet, Father, they've only been a mother to those children for a time. And they have lost those children in death. And Father, I pray for those mothers, especially on a day like today, where it can be a particularly sensitive day for this, Father. Lord, I pray that you would be the comfort for those mothers. And that you would hold them and sustain them, Father. And even though there's mourning, Father, I pray that that you will be an encouragement to their hearts and their souls. And Father, the last thing I want to pray for today is for mothers who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray, I pray that they would hear the gospel, they would bow the knee to Christ, they would come to know Christ, to, be, to have His Spirit reside in them, to be filled with the Spirit. What what a wonderful thing it is to be saved. And so many byproducts, one of those being to have an advocate and an encourager resident within yourself. And what a wonderful thing it is to go through parenting and all the different aspects of it, the highs, the lows, and everything in between. But to have the Holy Spirit within you who empowers us to be Christ-like to be able to parent in a Christ-like way. Lord, I pray for all of us that you fill us with your spirit that we might be able to do this and to do it for your glory. Father, I know I've not been able to pray for every single mother in every single situation, Lord, but, but where I don't know all those situations, you do. And I pray that you would meet mothers right where they are and strengthen them for the God-honoring task, the noble task, what it is to be a mother. 
we thank you for the mothers that you have blessed us with. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please take your song sheets for hymn number 179. Number 179, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Take your Bibles and once again turn to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we want to continue looking at verses 14 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 16. The title of the message is God's Church, part 3. And we want to finish out this passage, Lord willing, uh, this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, looking once again. At verses 14 through 16. Let me lay this ver these verses out in front of us this morning. Paul writing to Timothy says, beginning in verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, 
was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Well, we've been looking at this, and basically we have split this passage into three points. And we've already seen the first two. We saw, first of all, the identity of the church, uh, what the church is. And then second, we saw last time the conduct of the church. What is the conduct of the church? What should the conduct of the church be? And we saw, first of all, last time that there is a standard for conduct. There is a standard. Paul writes how one ought to conduct himself. There is that standard by which we are to conduct ourselves in the household, the church of the living God. And then second, we saw that the standard for the conduct is required. It is required. He says how one ought to conduct himself. And we talked about that word ought and how it means what is necessary. So this is not suggestive. This is not a suggestive standard. Uh, this is an ought to standard. This is a necessary standard standard. And then we also saw that it was the standard that has been assigned in the New Testament letters. Notice he says here, I am writing these things to you. Uh, there is a standard that he is listing out. How should one conduct themselves in the church? Well, he tells us right here in this letter. He says, that's why I'm writing this letter to you so that you will know how to do this. And it's not only this letter, it's not only 1 Timothy, it's all of the pastoral epistles. That would be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the book of Titus. And in fact, we can expand out even wider than that, and we can see how this instruction is replete in all of Paul's writings, in all of Peter's letters, all, all of the different letters of the New Testament. And so this is where we have this guidance. And then you remember last time we concluded with just talking about how some of these things find their way in our lives in practical areas. We started all the way from our personal life and, and how our personal life affects the household of God, going all the way to what we do together as a church. We talked about church officers. We talked about the way we administer the, the, the ordinances. We talked about what we do as a church together. And we talked about how there's that standard of conduct that is required among all of us. And now this gets us to the third thing, the confession of the church. We've seen the identity of the church. We've seen the conduct of the church. And so this morning we want to conclude this passage by looking at the confession of the church. Look again at this passage. Look, look, look beginning in verse 14 once again. I, I just want to get this before us one more time here. As we begin just to step through this. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, I'm writing these things to you. Hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Which is the church of the living God. The pillar and support of the truth. And then he says this. By common confession. Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. You know, as we, as we look at those lines, and if your Bible is like mine, it's got each one of those lines broken up into its own separate individual line. Uh, commentators are agreed that uh, we're almost certain that this was an ancient Christian hymn. That we're looking at here. I mean, you look at the design of it, the rhythm of it, the organization of it. I mean, it's all indicative of that. It all indicates that. And notice he says here, by common confession, uh, the word confession means to say the same as. In the Greek, it's the word homo legeo. Legeo, I speak, I say. Homo, same as. And that's what the word confession is, homo legeo. And so it's to say the same as. And so the idea here is, by common confession, this is without dispute here. There's no disputing this. In other words, we can all affirm this. Everyone who is a child of God, we all agree on these things. 
everyone who really belongs to the church, in, in the truest sense, we all agree on these things. So, this is the church's common confession. This is what Christians all over the place can say amen to. So, that being the case, well, what is our common confession as it's presented here? Now, let me just say this right, right at the outset. Obviously, there's more that we agree upon as believers than just what is here. But, what does he put here that we all agree upon? So, there are several things, and I want us to step through this. First of all, <clears throat> we see the astounding nature of the gospel. The astounding nature of the gospel. Look at it. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery. That, that is the unfolding. That is the, the revelation of godliness. As the gospel has been unfolded in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you can take this. You see the word godliness there. You, you can take this as godliness, which... Obviously, that can be a result of the gospel, godliness, or you could take this term as God-likeness, meaning that this could be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the, the revelation, the, the unveiling of Christ himself. But either way you take it, what we preach in the gospel message, the fact that God has stepped out of heaven, that he has come to earth, that he is incarnated in human flesh, that he brought sinners to God through his death and through his resurrection. Great is this mystery of godliness. I mean, it is outstanding. It is just mind-blowing. That's what he's saying here. The truth that God has made known in his son. He's saying, this. it is amazing. It is breathtaking. It is incomparable, this truth here. And notice what he says about that. He says, listen, the entire church agrees upon this. Now, I want to ask you a question. If Paul can say this in your heart of hearts, can you say the same thing? I mean, can you say the same thing about the gospel? Can you truly say in your heart that when it comes to the gospel... And when I think about the gospel, that it is, it is astounding to me. That the, 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 the gospel just amazes me. I mean, do you stand in awe of what you have learned and what you have received and come to know in the gospel? Or, or have, you, have you come so far in this that, quite frankly, you just yawn at these truths? Oh, it's just the gospel. Same old fundamental basic thing. Same old stuff. I've heard it a million times. Heard it a million times in sermons and Bible studies. Read it in books. Uh, just etc. 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 Listen. God help us. If this ever just remains in our heart. As something that is just commonplace. God help us. If we ever have the attitude in our heart. Well, this is just the gospel. Let me move on to those really, really greater truths. May it never be. God help us if what he has done for us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if that ceases to amaze us. May that never be the case. Because what Paul writes here, he says, great, great is the mystery of godliness. And notice the next thing he says here. And this is more of a general statement, but really it encompasses the entire thing. The second thing that we can all confess together is not only the astounding nature of the gospel, but second, the Christ-centered nature of this mystery. The Christ-centered nature of this mystery. But because what is this confession all about? I mean, what are we confessing here? Notice here what it all has in common. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Now let me ask you a question. Who is that talking about? 
That's talking about Christ, isn't it? That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, who is at the very center of this mystery that we preach? Right? We, we saw it earlier that this is what the church is. The church is the pillar and support of the truth. And what is at the center of the truth that the church stands for? Answer, it is a right understanding of who Christ is. It is a right understanding of Christ, a right view of Christ. It is faith in Jesus, which, of course, it means that one is brought uh, to God in true saving faith, and they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. But at the center of this mystery of godliness, it is Christ himself. It is Christ. That is what the church does. The church glorifies in her Savior. The church together is in agreement about this. We glory in Christ. We preach Christ. This is our very message. Our message is Christ. He's, he's our creed. He is at the center of the church. He's our shepherd. He's our savior. He's our Lord. He's our king. He's our God. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But, now we get into what is very specific that we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we get to the specifics of it. So, so what is this thing? It's amazing. It is centered upon him. And now what are we going to see? Now we're going to see some amazing facts about Christ. And the first one uh, is this, that the Savior of the world is God incarnate. The Savior is God incarnate. Jesus of Nazareth. Who is he? Jesus of Nazareth is God come to earth. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Look at what it says in verse 16. He who was revealed in the flesh. Now listen, understand this. That does not mean that he had his beginning in Bethlehem. That is not what that is saying. That does not mean that Jesus began when he was born in Bethlehem. No, look at what it says. It says he was revealed in the flesh. And flesh there doesn't refer to, to, to the sinful nature of man that, that we all have. No, that's not the reference here at all. But rather it just refers to, to flesh and blood. It refers to the body. So what we have here is this. This God that we worship, he was manifested. He was revealed in flesh and and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. God came to man. God came to earth. God took to himself a sinless human nature. God, this says, was revealed in the flesh. Listen, God, who always existed in the second person of the triune God, who, who always had an existence, and then he was brought face to face with us in the flesh. The creator, I mean, just think about it. Now, no wonder Paul says this just blows your mind. The creator now comes into his creation, and he now is face to face with it. The creator now face to face with his creation in time, in flesh. And the apostle Paul says that is so amazing. Great. Is the mystery of godliness. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this. And the word, and the word who was with God and was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, that's John the Baptist, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. Now listen to this. For he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. You see, grace comes from this one. Grace comes from this one. This one who, who preceded not only John the Baptist, though John was born first, but he also preceded Abraham, though Abraham was born before him. And so this is now God in 
the flesh. And in 1 John 4, it makes it plain that, and, and, I, and I love the letters of John, 1 John, 2 John, and then 3 John. Because I want to tell you, John pulls no punches in those letters. I mean, he calls a spade a spade. There's black and there's white and there's no gray whatsoever there. And basically right here in 1 John chapter 4, John is writing this letter and he says, listen, if you do not confess that Jesus is God come in the flesh, you're not a Christian. I mean, you're just not a Christian if you can't make that confession from the heart. Listen to what he says, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, uh, in other words, does not confess this Jesus that has come in the flesh, is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. And we need to understand that. Listen, this world is full of antichrists who deny the biblical Jesus. Listen, if you want to know where someone stands with God, find out where they stand with Jesus. Find out what they think about Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they have the wrong Jesus. The Mormons, they have the wrong Jesus. Islam has the wrong Jesus. And listen, there are countless other groups sprinkled all over the world who have the wrong Jesus. The church is the church simply because it has come to believe the truth about Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is God revealed in the flesh. That is who Jesus is. Now notice the next thing he tells us in verse 16. Specifically about this great mystery that has been unfolded. The next thing we see is that Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. Notice what it says here. He who was revealed in the flesh, now second here, was vindicated in the Spirit. You say, what does that mean? What does that word vindicated mean? Well, very simply, the word vindicated means to be declared righteous. Was vindicated in the Spirit. Was declared righteous by the Spirit. And I think what this is talking about, I think this is talking about the activity of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ during the time of his earthly walk. And by the Spirit's power, uh, what was demonstrated in the, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is that he was indeed exactly who he claimed to be. The Spirit demonstrated that through all the many things that took place in the life of Christ, that, that living as a man among men by the power of the Spirit, there was a clear, a crystal clear demonstration that this man was and is the Son of God. This man was and is God incarnate. Let me just give you some verses on this. John chapter 7, verse 44. We see, first of all, that the Spirit was at work making this plain in the life of Christ. Making it plain in his life. Listen, John chapter 7, verse 44. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said, Why did you not bring him? Okay, you get the picture. Okay, we, we sent him to you to arrest him. You've come back empty-handed. Where is he at? Why have you not brought him to us? Listen to what it says here. The officers answered. All right, you wait for this answer, okay? It better, it better be a good one, right? We sent you to arrest him. You didn't bring him back. Why? Listen to this. Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Isn't that amazing? Dispatched to go arrest him. Commissioned to go arrest him. Come back empty-handed. Why haven't you brought him in? Well, 
It's because of the way he spoke. The way he spoke. Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And as Christ lived his earthly life, he did other things that, that, that no one had ever seen before. I mean, he was opening the eyes of the blind. He was healing people who were lame from birth. And there was absolutely no explanation. How are they able to do this? How are they able to get up and walk? Listen, this is not like a, a faith healer service for someone who's crippled kind of can maybe generate enough enthusiasm to kind of get up and hop. No, these people were made whole. They were jumping and leaping, fully healthy. And this is what was going on here. And then raising a dead man, raising Lazarus from the dead. And so through the life and the ministry of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, there's this clear picture that this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the Messiah. This one is God come to live among men. So the Spirit was at work in his life. The Spirit was also at work in his dying. So that even in his death, his true identity was unmistakable. Listen to Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 54. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook. And the rocks were split, and tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. Watching how he died, watching all the things that happened around his death, there was now this confession. Truly, this was the Son of God. Mark 15, 39, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So we have the Holy Spirit of God just empowering Jesus to live as he lived, and he made clear, he made it plain who Jesus really was. It is the Spirit of God empowering Jesus as he died the way he died, making clear, making plain that this is truly the Son of God. And then even more, you have the Spirit of God at work in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the resurrection itself, he was declared to be the Son of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says this to believers. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, how was Jesus raised from the dead? Well, the answer here, it is by the same spirit who lives in you. It is by the Holy Spirit of God so that in the very resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was a demonstration of the Spirit's power, and through the resurrection of Jesus, he was declared to be the Son of God. So the church agrees that he is God manifested in the flesh, and the church looks at the record of his life, and the church looks at the record of his death, and the record of his resurrection, which was accomplished by the Holy Spirit of God. And the church says, look at that. There, there is vindication there. There is the declaration of his true identity. And that, that is what we do. We, we say with the centurions, this one is surely the Son of God. That is our declaration. That is our confession. And then notice also here that Jesus is testified by angels. The next statement, moving on, in verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. He is testified about by angels. Notice, seen by angels. Short little phrase. Seen by angels. But there's so much in this. Because it's interesting. Because it indicates that the testimony of the true identity of Jesus. Listen, it's not 
It's not just sort of that mute, uh, inaudible testimony that, that was the working of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not just that, and it's not just human testimony, but it is also the testimony of holy angels, the holy angels of God. By their statements, by their activities, they bore witness to the identity of Jesus of Nazareth and they made it plain that he is indeed God incarnate, that he is indeed truly the only Son of God. And when you study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, you, you, you just see an outbreak of angelic activity here upon this world. You see it at his birth. You see it at significant times in his life. You see it at the resurrection. You see it at the ascension. So all the way from his coming to earth to his going back into heaven, uh, these angelic witnesses are there who, who bring testimony to who Jesus really is. Let me give you just some verses on this as well. Think about his birth, Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. It says there that the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Son of God. And listen, not just to Mary. Listen to this. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly shone, uh, suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord, Lord shone round them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So we see angelic activity telling Mary he's going to be the Son of God, proclaiming to these the shepherds that the, the Lord has come. And now what about, what about in the life of Jesus? What about in the life of Jesus when he is tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself? And after he has stood all of that temptation, and each time he's answering the temptation with the Word of God over and over and over again, Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 says this Then the devil left him and behold angels came and began to minister to him Think about the garden of Gethsemane Luke chapter 22 verses 41 to 43 And he that's Christ withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and began to pray saying Father if you were willing Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And you think about not only those occurrences, but after his resurrection. Listen to this, John chapter 20, verses 12, 13, and 14. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying, and they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. I mean, before Mary saw the resurrected Christ, she hears the testimony 
from angels that he's not here. He's not here. Why, why are you weeping? He's alive. Angelic testimony. And then, and then there's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's standing with his disciples after his resurrection. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. It says this, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remote, remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now listen to this. As they were gazing intently to the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has just been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So from his birth to his ascension, his birth, his life, his resurrection, his ascension, Scripture says he is seen by angels. Watched, beheld, helped, testified by angels. And so we hear the testimony of those angels. And what does the church do? The church says, Amen. The church says, Amen. That, that, that is exactly who our Savior is. Everything they say about him, we believe. It is true. It's true. And then notice next that Jesus is preached to the nations. Next step, statement in verse 16. This is what we can say with common confession. It says, He is proclaimed among the nations. The church says that this one, Jesus, He is the only Savior of men. He, he must be preached to the nations because He is the only hope for the nations. There's only one Savior of men, and it is Christ. Listen to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other way for man to be reconciled to God than this one way. It is Christ. Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That is as true in Asia as it is here. That is as true in Africa as it is here. That is as true in Latin America as it is here. He must be preached to the nations because he's the only hope for all mankind. And so the true church has a missionary focus. The true church understands the need for evangelism, the true church recognizes that unless people hear about Jesus, they're going to perish. I mean, they're going to die and they're going to perish if they do not hear and receive and believe in the gospel. And the church understands that. And so the church is to have a burden for the lost. He has, it says, been proclaimed among nations, and he is to be proclaimed among nations. But notice something else in verse 16. That Jesus is actually saving people. He's actually saving people right now. Look at it. He is believed on in the world. That is to say that our Savior is actually saving people. Men are actually, that they've come to, they are coming to believe in him. And by faith in him, they're being saved. And the church confesses this. The true church, the entirety of the true church confesses this. And then that gets us to the last part of this hymn and this confession. And that is that Jesus is enthroned. He's enthroned. Look at what it says. 
taken up in glory. We believe that this one, this Jesus right now, we believe he is alive and we believe that he is enthroned in heaven. He has sat down, scripture says, at the right hand of God, having accomplished all that God has given him to accomplish in his coming into the world. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 puts it this way. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When did he do that? He's done it. That, that is where he's at. He is there right now. Where is Christ at right now? He is seated at the right hand of God. Seated upon the throne right now, today. Where is our Savior at today? He is seated in heaven, enthroned. And our King is enthroned in heaven. And our King is sovereignly bringing men to salvation in this time, in this world. And he is an enthroned king, an alive enthroned king. So you see what Paul is doing here is he's writing these things so that we'll know what it means to be part of the church. That we'll know what the church is. That we'll know what, what kind of conduct is acceptable in the church. And he's also writing this so that we will know what the church believes, what the church commonly confesses. And we're given this to live by, right? And we're given this to live by until when? And you think about that, you look at this and you think about, well, well what's the one thing that's not in this hymn? I mean, look, look where it ends. He's taken up into glory. And remember, what did the angels say? When the disciples were looking at Jesus as he was taken up into glory, what did the angels tell them? They said this, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. In other words, he's going to come the same way. He's going to come visibly. He's going to come bodily. And he is going to come to bring all that God has ordained to its intended end. I want to ask you this morning. Do, do you believe that? I mean, are you living for that? Are you living for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Does, does that simple fact, knowing he's coming again. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning a little bit. Our blessed hope. Do, does that blessed hope, does that truth of knowing he's coming back again, does that, does that change the way you live your life? Does, does that have any effect on how you live your life? Listen, do you know why there's this sad reality in the church today here, right now, where you have so many professing believers who have a deficient view of, of what it means to be part of the church? Do you know why that is the case? Do you know why that is an issue? Well, one reason is, I mean, I think there are many reasons, but I believe really one reason is that even though we confess these things that we've just seen here, we really don't believe these things. And the proof that we're not really believing these things is that we're not living like we believe these things. I mean, many times in churches, we'll, we'll, we'll say these things, we'll read these things right out of the Word of God. We say we confess them, but we don't really believe it in the sense that we embrace it because it does not affect the way we live. There's more, no, no transformation in, in how we live. So the question for us this morning is, are we living like we believe these things? And I want to get it just down to an individual focus. I mean, I want to get this just down to you. You, not, not anyone else. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, wow, I hope so-and-so might listen to this, or this would be good if so-and-so. No, I want to talk about you. Just you. Not someone else, but you. Me. Me. Are we living like we 
believe these truths. Because this is what the church is. And this is how the church is to behave. And this is what the church is to believe. So may the Lord help us in his fullness to be able to live like we believe it. And though in our strength we are prone to fail, that we know that by his spirit and by his grace and by his power, we can walk in this way. We can walk in a way that pleases the Lord. We can walk in a way that is reflective of what we say we believe by common confession, what the church believes. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for the encouragement of the scriptures. They're so convicting to us, Father. But your truth not only convicts us, but it encourages us. And we're so thankful that it refreshes us as well. The, the same word that exposes our sin is the same word that also washes away our sin, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. So, Father, I pray, I pray for Redeeming Grace Baptist Church for all of us. Father, may this local congregation, may we be a congregation that receives your word joyfully and in faith. May we live like we, but we believe it, Father. Please give us the grace to be able to do so by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a, a song, a hymn that has a lot of those aspects in it. Actually, you can, you can make a, a case for all of them. That's number 212, uh, Glorious Day. Um, and he added, there was one thing he didn't mention, and that's uh, Christ's return. This one has that in it, too. So we'll, we'll hit that as well.
close today with a benediction that we usually sing um, after communion, but um, just with our longing for fellowship and um, our hope that we'll be back together soon, we'll sing the family of God.